All right, it's uh, 4.30 and calling the meeting to order and acknowledge that the District of Tino operates within the territory of the Tlaifle First Nation, the Tlaifle and Ahuhli. A notice to attendees that meeting is being video recorded and will be published on the District of Tofino's YouTube channel. Uh, through unanimous consent, if there are no objections, I'll move that pursuant to section 15 of the District of Tofino meeting procedure bylaw number 1229 2016 is amended to November 2022, November 22nd, 2022 regular council meeting be held electronically via Zoom and live broadcast on the District of Tofino's YouTube channel. And that the facility provided for the public to watch and hear the meeting be located at Minister Hall 121 3rd Street in Tofino BC. Seeing no objection, that motion is carried. And uh, uh, through unanimous consent, if there are no objections, I'll move that the November 22nd, 2022 regular council agenda be adopted. Also through unanimous consent, uh, and this is the consent agenda. If there are no objections, I'll move that items 4.1 to 4.2 on the consent agenda and regular Council meeting held November 2020, 2022 be approved and received. No objection, that motion is carried. Uh, public comment on agenda items. Thank you, Mary Lott. We do actually have a member of the public in attendance in the viewing gallery that would like to speak on an agenda item. So I will go grab them. But before I do that, um, we do have a few members of the public in attendance electronically as well. So. For anybody who's in attendance via Zoom, you're welcome to use the public comment period to speak to an item on the agenda. To do that, you can use the Q&A function and just enter your name, your address, and which agenda item you'd like to speak to. So I will call once, call twice, calling three times. Okay, so no electronic participation, but I will be right back. This, this is gonna be our first e person uh, from the public. It is. This is a special occasion. I think people are better in 3D, to be honest, you know, the Zoom thing. Do we have to wear 3D glasses? It's naturally 3D. Rock and roll. Good afternoon, uh, Your Worship, Members of Council. My name is Andy Gaylor. I am a planner with McElhaney. Um, my residential address is 249 7th Avenue in Campbell River. I'm joined here by my client, Jay Gilbenheis. Hello. Um, so, um, yeah, I am speaking to the rezoning application at 1141 Pacific Rim Highway, which I believe is item 10.1. Yeah. Um, I'm going to declare conflict of interest. The zoning application that they're speaking to uh might reasonably uh be construed to affect my business interests thank you Councilor Anderson. just hold off a bit yeah. thank you okay so uh, before i start i just wanted to thank uh, your worship and members of council for your support in in granting our application to extend the temporary use permit in april um i know that application associated with the previous owner has a little bit of uh sorted history um so we really appreciate the opportunity for that extension um i know a big part of of the resolution of of this application is a rezoning application so, okay, guys, so uh, before I start, I just wanted to oh, okay. hold on. Thank you. Members of council for your job before. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so, yeah, we're very pleased to make a zoning application. We're very committed to providing permanent solutions um, to this to this file. So, here we are. Uh, we're very pleased to be on the agenda for initial consideration, uh, recognizing we still have a little bit of work to do. And, and I'm not going to get into the details of the application. I believe your staff and we're uh, Planner Thick will be providing a, a comprehensive overview of our application. I will, however, note uh, that the major nexus for this application isn't to build a major development, isn't to build a, a big multifamily project. Um, it's it's really to address a pretty critical need in the district, and that's the notion of, of staff accommodation. Uh, Jay has been a local business owner here for almost 20 years. Um, 
I think you recognize this, there's a very critical need to provide staff accommodation in the district. So that's really genuinely the, the central purpose of this application. Uh, there is some ancillary tourism accommodation that's proposed and has to opt to generate some revenue during the shoulder season. Um, but again, we are very thankful for staff support of our application. We really enjoyed working with your professional staff. Uh, again, there is some work to do. We recognize that there's been some questions about maybe the amount of tourism accommodation, maybe some questions about the amount of uh, the parking. We know there's been some localized flooding and some traffic impacts in Hellison. Uh, all matters that we will be addressing um, if, if council uh, allows us to move forward with initial consideration. So I'll leave it there and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Invite Councillor Anderson back in. And that's it for public comments. Super. Okay. Mayor's report. I'm uh, just going to say how. Uh, how much I'm enjoying the ongoing corporate organ or orientation and getting a chance to see uh, see uh, the district inner workings all over again. So I do I do appreciate that and uh, I do thank the staff for all their hard work on that. And I look forward to to continuing that. And uh, that's about it. All I have for uh, for really for the mayor's report. Um, Moving on, delegations, we have Bob Hansen. That's great, and Bob is here in the viewing gallery, so I'll go back and for you. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. We have uh, Mr. Bob Hansen, Wild Safe BC Pacific Rim Coordinator. Welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Your Worship and Council, uh, for this opportunity to report on the activities of the Wild Safe BC Pacific Rim Program. My name is Bob Hansen, and I've been in the role of Community Coordinator this past five years. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Marianne uh, Paquette, who we shared the coordinator role this year. Hi everyone, thank you for having us. Uh, so my name is Marianne Paquette and I'm the co-coordinator for the Pacific Rim Program. And this is my third season with Wild CPC. In the past two seasons, I was working as the Hitatsu Makua uh, coordinator. Leave the right arrow will be to the next slide and just give it about a half second delay. Okay, great. Uh, the presentation provides an overview since April of wildlife activity, human wildlife coexistence challenges and opportunities um, to keep wildlife wild and our community safe. The next few slides will sketch out the overview with some help of some highlights describing both the bad news and the good news. They provide context for the end of the presentation where we'll talk about the road ahead for coexisting with wildlife. To start, here are some numbers that show the real challenges and real consequences experienced in this year. So there were eight food condition bears lethally euthanized. <clears throat> 35 sheds and structures were accessed by bears. Eight outdoor freezers were accessed by bears. There were four instances of commercial grease bins accessed by bears. 35 vehicles were opened and four significantly damaged. Uh, this is a mistake that's supposed to read 21 commercial bins accessed. Uh, and uh, further to that, uh, we did do a survey uh, when it became evident how significant an issue this was. And we found, uh, we surveyed 93 commercial bins in the community and 52% of those 
were secured, but 40% were unsecured and accessible by bears. And there were eight instances of bears getting into chicken coops. There were also 51 close encounters between people and bears, and that's very close encounters, and seven cases where a bear entered a building with people inside. So, mm -hmm. so I'm just gonna do a, a little bit of an overview uh, of our season. Uh, so all the activities that took place between mid-April uh, to November. And um, so we were uh, able to do these activities that involve education, outreach, training, and other conflict prevention initiatives. Uh, so we had a six Wild Safe Ranger presentation to school-aged children, reaching a total of 190 students and teachers. We actually have updated numbers on the wildlife awareness and safety presentation. So we're now at 19 with a recent staff training session, uh, and we're able to reach a total of 287 participants. We did five door-to-door -door activities in seven neighborhoods experiencing high wildlife activity, and we delivered information packages to 370 residences. Uh, we hosted eight display booths where we were able to answer questions on the local wildlife and attract and management practices with both residents and visitors, reaching over a thousand people. And we've seen a 10% increase in Facebook followers for the Wealthy BC Pacific Rim page, uh, and we've created over 40 educational posts. Um, and these posts have really been shared by many of our partners, which has helped increase the reach uh, of our page greatly. Uh, we now have five local businesses that have taken the Watsi BC Business Pledge and have made the necessary changes to create an environment that is safe for their staff, uh, the community, and also the local wildlife. And these businesses include Ocean Outfitters, Gaia Grocery, Long Beach Lodge Resort, Embarky Coolit, and Jamie's Whaling Station. And uh, we also have nine more businesses that are working uh, with us right now and making really great progress. We have two bear campsite programs. So two campgrounds have taken the bear campsite pledge and we've provided staff training for uh, their staff earlier this year. There's been uh, 14 electric fences that have been installed this season with an, issue, an additional nine detail consultation provided for future projects. And uh, there's now a total of 18 new bear resistant bins that have been purchased by both residents and businesses. And we have a, a sh small updates from our PowerPoint here. So two uh, more bear resistant bins have been added and we were made aware of this this morning by the local business that has decided to replace some, replace some of their bins, sorry. And then lastly, uh, we have calculated the increase in people reached from 2021 to 2022 and found that there was a 90% increase uh, in our reach. And this increase was due to the ability of the program to have two coordinators working on initiatives this year. And uh, if we can play this, uh, th this is just a, a visual overview of our season uh, that is gonna describe the activities we've been doing uh, in, in images. So hopefully. Let's do it this year. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. So that brings us to the roadmap uh, for moving ahead in this coexistent journey uh, with wildlife in our communities. And here are some milestones and goals 
uh, for that road ahead. <clears throat> so in terms of milestones, implementation of the new wildlife attractant management bylaw is a major milestone. And that really addresses a, a significant gap in our efforts to coexist with wildlife. Uh, another major milestone that's about to happen in the coming week is the delivery of 2,800 bear resistant carts put in the hands of residents for uh, wild safe storage of uh, garbage and compost. In terms of an aspirational goals, uh, we'd like to recommend, as is recommended in the Tofino uh, Wildlife Conflict Management Plan, is inclusion of waste management requirements within wild safe waste management requirements within business license conditions, and also as a requirement for development permits. <clears throat> I'd like to also recommend that the district apply for bear smart community status as with the passing of the bylaw and all of the other things that have happened in the past year or so, um, all of the requirements for bear smart status have been met by the district of Tofino. So uh, that would be great to move forward and actually apply for that. And um, we look forward to continuing to work with uh, Sarah and also her counterpart in District of Euclid in expanding the information and making more accessible uh, wildlife related information through the district's website. And also we hope to work more in, closely with uh, Tourism Tofino and Euclid. And we will be submitting a letter, a formal request for consideration of secure multi-year funding for the Wild Safe BC program um, to increase its, its capacity and scope. We'd really like to build on the momentum that's been built up over the last five seasons. And ultimately, uh, we hope to move towards a year-round position in recognition that um, many things such as working on bylaws or business license conditions or hand, handbooks for developers, those sorts of tasks are not really feasible to address in the busy summer season. And the winter is the time when we could really make progress on that. And also the business pledge program and, and many other initiatives, it's, there's a whole, uh, list of activities that are important but not really feasible to undertake in the summer. And we'd really like to thank you for your ongoing support and uh, for your leadership. And it's been great working with you on keeping wildlife wild in our community safe. Thank you both. Thank you. That's great. And I really appreciate all your work. And it uh, it's, feels great to be part of it district to, to be moving ahead in such a good way. Mm -hmm. Questions from council for either of our presenters? Yes, Councilor Master and then Councilor Steer. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's been some issues with bears and the commercial establishments this mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of reception did you get when you pointed out uh, some of the issues? Uh, uh, we were... Um, we did reach out as as we had earlier in the season to some of the establishments and uh, we uh, met up with some of the establishments recently in the past week or so and had a tour of their operations and pointed out the vulnerabilities that we could see as well as recommendations on ways that they could address those and we encouraged them to partner with us on the wild safe bc uh, pledge program, which is uh, maybe you could speak to the steps involved in the Wild Safe BC pledge. 
Yeah, so what we generally do with businesses is that we meet with them, talk about the pledge, see if that's something that they're interested in. And then we do a walk around of the business and just uh, point out some things that could be um, maybe a little bit better uh, and give some a list of, of items that could be applied for that specific business. Um, and then uh, from that, we give them a, a full report with all the information they need, uh, links to the right places so that they can get the information uh, and potentially quotes and all these kind of things to see what they're uh, um, they're looking at. And then we uh, provide them with ongoing support. Uh, and then that can be over, you know, a few months, that can be over a year. Uh, and we're really uh, doing a bit of back and forth and seeing how we can support them uh, so that they can achieve all the, the criteria we have on our pledge. And a key part of it is staff training. So to complete the, pro, uh, the pledge, uh, staff training is part of it. And that's uh, part of an ongoing relationship over time. So so even though they uh, may have achieved all of the requirements, we'll continue to train their staff as time goes on. So our relationship continues past meeting all those requirements. It is a, a year pledge, basically, that uh, they receive a poster at the end with uh, the year. Um, and uh, that's something that's renewed every uh, every single year. And we uh, connect with them uh, to see where they're at and if there's anything we can support further. And again, staff training is something that we do every year. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, hoping to get, uh, get more businesses on board. So some of the uh, 16... Um, recently purchased and installed uh, bear resistant containers that came as a result of working with businesses on on their business pledge. Um, also the picture where I'm standing beside a wooden fence with electric fencing. That was another example and worked with that business uh, to protect their recycling operation that was being accessed by a bear. So so it has many components. It's it's uh, uh, quite a considerable uh, partnership uh, when we partner up with a business. So we're hoping just to keep building the number of businesses that we're working with and some of those key businesses that you mentioned. So it sounds like you had some acceptance. Did you encounter any resistance at all? Uh, well, <laughs> the, the um, um, yeah, it, not I'd like to get into specifics. So, so we do find that um, uh, at times there's immediate immediate interest, and and off we go. And then there's other instances where <clears throat> there's some interest, and then there's a passage of some amount of time, and then there's a whole series of incidents that increase the interest. So, so uh, then we were, you know, we resume at that point. And uh, so that's sort of the pattern we see is sometimes um, there are significant events that happen that really sort of are motivating. So, well, and where um, that's a good example of where the bylaw comes into play, because that fills a very specific gap because there are very specific requirements that relate to businesses and residents within that. And those weren't there previously. So, so that's uh, going to add to the conversation as well. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Steer. Okay. Uh, just a quick, well, two questions. One, um, the bearer smart certification and We've gone through them as we've discussed all the, the steps that are there. What is the next uh, stage and sort of the formal process of, of application for, for what the district need to do? Well, in conversation with uh, Mike Badry, who's the provincial person that leads that, that file, um, he submitted uh, to us some information on what they need in an application package. So it's basically sitting down this winter. Um, I know all of the information that's needed exists. It's a matter of sitting down and I'd be happy to volunteer some time to sit down with district staff this winter and pull together that application and then and then sending it off. They've already given us some early indication that uh, they feel we've met all the requirements. So 
Thank you. And then just quickly, um, speaking uh, of the challenges around long-term funding, which is, uh, of course, in terms of the uh, the significant work that Wells APC does for this community, and you reiterated many of those. Um, and I know we're coming up into budget process. Has, um, have you had conversation at this point in terms of uh, what those uh, potential asks might be in terms of securing that long-term funding and what, what the amounts might look like so that there might be something, if there was a council discussion around that, uh, what that might look like? Yes, um, I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> I think I might interject here. That yeah, conversations are ongoing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think in terms of um, um, getting a sense of um, what is, you know, it, it. There's various things to talk about there in terms of what is would be a reasonable request and um, balanced with what we hope to be able to achieve, so. Right. And then just one last thing, a, a little plug for your uh, the workshop that's coming up very soon. Here. Thank you. <laughs> Might want to uh, just give that a quick plug while you've got the opportunity. Yeah, so this coming Saturday, there will be electric fencing workshop uh, at the community center from 10 till noon. And it's an opportunity to find out everything you want to know about electric fencing and anyone would want to know. And then we'll go out and, and we'll get some hands on experience putting up a temporary fence on the lawn at the community center. So really hoping to get a good turnout there. Super. Seeing no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just ask when this bylaw etc is going to come before council? Do they have the bylaw yet? Uh, we can ask for that after. As. <laughs> Yeah. On to the presentation for the courts. We have zoning amendment bylaw, Mr. Thick. Manager. Oh, yes. Um, I am declaring conflict of interest on this matter. Um, as my business could be reasonably deemed to be affected by the application. Thank you, Councilor. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor and Council, or early evening. Uh, I think the presentation is just loading up. Um, as you can see on the screen, this presentation has to do with the uh, report that was part of Council's package uh, regarding the property at 1141 Pacific Rim Highway. Uh, we're considering a zoning amendment for that property, and this is the permission to proceed stage. So quite an early stage in the overall zoning amendment process. Uh, as a way of introduction, the application was received on July 26th of this year. Um, again, as noted, this is a permission to proceed report, so there isn't actually a bylaw involved with this report at this point. Um, Council will not be voting on a bylaw, we'll just be voting on uh, whether or not staff should put the time into actually create a bylaw right now. Really what this report uh, is focused on is, is generally just introducing the idea seeking some initial feedback and uh, one of the more important or at least legislatively important aspects of this uh, particular report is to decide whether or not to hold a public hearing with relation to this application. So these are all things that I'll talk about throughout this presentation, but I just wanted to kind of introduce uh, what this report really was um, at this point. So again, high level, looking for some initial feedback, introducing the idea, um, but no uh, bylaw is presented today. The location uh, right on the corner of Pacific Rim Highway and Hellison Drive. Uh, this is probably is also known as, as Crab Apple Campground, kind of colloquially. Uh, it's been the site of both sanctioned and unsanctioned camping activities for the past uh, many years. Uh, currently operates under a temporary use permit uh, for long term staff camping. Uh, the proposal at hand is really kind of what we best characterize as a resort style development. Um, there are tourism accommodation units, staff accommodation units, as well as some accessory commercial uses. Um, I kind of say it's a resort style development because it's not really a resort in the more traditional sense of the word where we typically see primarily the focus of the resort being tourism accommodation. The focus of this development, as we heard from the applicants earlier this evening, is really on providing staff accommodation uh, with the tourism accommodation portion being uh, a somewhat more minor portion of the development. 
Uh, so currently the proposal is uh, to have 22 nightly rental units. So, so these would be 22 bedrooms total. These would be tourism accommodation bedrooms, mostly uh, kind of located in these uh, sort of single single story uh, uh, modular structures. Um, these aren't luxurious accommodations. They more resemble hostel accommodations. Uh, 59 of the uh, bedrooms would be reserved for staff accommodation solely. And there would be some other accessory commercial uses such as a cafe and convenience store. Uh, the primary focus, uh, according to the applicant, is to provide staff accommodation for uh, their existing businesses as well as other businesses in town uh, as accommodation is available. So when we take a quick look through our policy, uh, the vision to action, that's our integrated community sustainability plan. Uh, we're generally aligned with kind of the high level comments in there, um, mostly to do with uh, adequate housing for individuals in the community, access to employment, those sorts of things. Again, one of the things that staff always like to mention within the vision to action is, is that it has these kind of comments about limits to growth. They're not defined. Um, they're kind of these nebulous ideas, but it's something that comes up quite regularly, particularly when considering an application to increase the density on a particular lot as the one we're considering today. Uh, within the OCP, um, we find that the application is actually generally aligned. However, it's not completely supported or some of the aspects of the development are, are quite low priority, I guess is the, is the most accurate way to describe it. Um, so uh, particularly the tourism accommodation portion of the proposed development, um, this is not something that's prohibited within the OCP. Uh, in fact, within the ocean interface designation, it's something that is um, supported within that particular designation. However, within the OCP as a whole, we're looking to generally curtail and, and uh, you know, not exactly prioritize further tourism development uh, at this point in time. The way I would best describe it is that, uh, you know, we don't really want tourism development, but if we did want it, this is kind of where we want it to go. Um, it's also within uh, both the coastal flooding and tsunami hazard zone. Um, it's also you know, kind of a dense development outside the village core. However, the, the very positive aspect of this development is that it provides some much needed housing um, uh, on a property that, that already does actually have some, some affordable housing uh, of a form. So looking at the housing needs assessment, um, the type of housing is, is very much supported. This is uh, sort of lower income staff accommodation units. Um, the housing needs assessment doesn't comment on tourism accommodation or, or commercial uh, uses. Um, however, the general idea of providing more housing is something that's certainly supported within that, that plan. Within the multimodal transportation plan, um, you know, the property itself is outside the downtown core. However, the advantage that it does have is that it does have, you know, fairly close proximity to various amenities, including recreational amenities such as Mackenzie Beach. There's uh, an established crosswalk at Hellison getting over to the multi-use path. So there is access for active transport uh, on the other side of the highway, as well as it being within walking distance to uh, the outside rate complex, which offers uh, various uh, commercial opportunities, grocery shopping, those kinds of things. Um, looking at the land use and demand study, uh, there's, there's general support for, for service commercial um, as well as staff accommodation. There's not too much comment on tourism commercial within that, uh, that study. Uh, there's actually not very much comment on where these things should go. It mostly just outlines that um, uh, there, there is a desire for some additional commercial space um, as well as uh, staff accommodation and, and smaller lower income units. Uh, looking at the zoning, currently the zoning is uh, A1, so this is a small holdings district. It's basically a kind of larger rural residential kind of zone. Um, it allows uh, two units of housing on it right now, so, so we're looking at increasing the density very significantly through this rezoning uh, should we continue to move forward, and we will be drafting a comprehensive development zone for council's consideration um, in order to replace the existing A1 zone. Uh, having a quick look from a, a bit more of a formal planning perspective, um, looking at the form and character of the development, uh, this property is within the tourism focused development permit area. That development permit area does contain provisions for both environmental as well as form and character guidelines. Um, staff have no initial considerations at this point, uh, though should we move forward, we'll probably look at the, the plot layout and, and the site plan and kind of run it through the guidelines for the tourism focused DPA uh, just for council's information. Um, however, the point being, uh, we do have a development permit process to go through prior to any uh, building happening on the site. Um, so uh, there, there's kind of another layer of oversight that council has at this point. It is worth noting that tourism focused development permits are delegated to staff, however. So if the applicant comes forward and uh, meets the guidelines and uh, is generally approved by the uh, design review panel, um, staff are, are 
typically uh, you know, obliged to issue the development permit at that point. Um, so having uh, comments around form and characters is not, uh, you know, not out of line at this point. However, this is fairly early in the, in the rezoning stage, uh, as well as zoning tends to focus primarily on use and density over specific form. Uh, looking at the housing, so staff accommodation is permitted within the ocean interface. Um, it's a very useful and supportive form of housing within our OCP, other plans and policies as well. Um, what's kind of interesting uh, to note is that other residential is really not supported by the OCP in this area. Our OCP actually uh, kind of prohibits uh, further residential development at this point outside of the village core. That's kind of uh, any area south of, of uh, industrial way. Um, we would also be looking at a housing agreement for this kind of thing. So it's, it's a very specific kind of form of housing, a bit of a subset of residential development uh, dedicated to a very particular type of, of individual. These are kind of lower income people who are often new to town, who are working at specific businesses within the district. Um, and we would be looking at a housing agreement to ensure that uh, the housing is used for that purpose and that purpose alone. Uh, looking at the tourism accommodation, uh, again, this is not prioritized by the OCP, but it is in what we would consider an appropriate area if this was the type of development that we would want. Um, uh, the, the primary motivation for including tourism accommodation uh, by the applicant is to offset the cost of supplying the staff accommodation. So again, um, the, the stated intent of, of this application is to provide staff accommodation. This is quite an expensive endeavor. Um, and so to offset that cost, uh, having some sort of tourism accommodation um, may be appropriate. Uh, yeah, the, the, there's staff acknowledge that there's a little bit of a give and take one um, uh, sort of comparison that is not a direct comparison, but maybe appropriate to think about is the THC uh, needing to sell off pieces of land at market value in order to subsidize the, the uh, development that they're uh, involved in currently. So there, there's often, um, uh, yeah, significant cost in developing this kind of housing uh, that is challenging to be recouped by, by any developer, whether they be nonprofit or, or private sector. Uh, looking at traffic access and parking, um, uh, access is proposed to stay the same as it is. Uh, traffic is certainly a consideration uh, when you're increasing this kind of density. We'll be requiring a traffic impact assessment by a, um, a registered engineer at a later point in the, uh, in the process, should we proceed. Um, that'll help us kind of understand a little bit more about whether the access is appropriate, how we might want to consider um, uh, offsetting any impacts to traffic or mitigating any challenges that are that are associated with this particular development. Uh, and then parking, uh, I made a number of notes within the staff report about that. Uh, staff are supportive of the parking plan at this point, though acknowledge that it is, is fairly minimal. Um, again, the, this, this minimal parking kind of relies on, on the, uh, a particular type of user uh, taking advantage of the staff accommodation uh, and even the tourism accommodation as well. Um, and these, uh, these sort of target users would be people that generally do not have vehicles. Um, servicing, uh, this is kind of the, the standard routine for us at this point, we'd be looking to run uh, any servicing requirements through our water model as well as, as receive a full servicing brief um, at a later point in the application process uh, should things proceed. Uh, fire protection, um, so flow analysis would be part of the servicing brief um, and we would be looking at further review with the fire chief uh, probably uh, post first reading uh, as we move through our full referral process. Uh, flooding and tsunami, this is another thing that staff have outlined as, as one of the you know, sort of primary concerns uh, with this application. It's in both a, a noted tsunami area as well as a, as well as a you know an area that's prone to flooding. Uh, so things like careful site planning, evacuation plans, other mitigation tactics are, are certainly relevant here. Um, I think I spoke about it at length in the staff report. So there's not much need to kind of uh, reiterate anything at this point. But but needless to say, this is a uh, an important point of consideration. Our, our OCP doesn't prohibit this kind of development in these areas, but it is very cautious about it as well. Um, and then considering the community amenity contributions, um, uh, typically staff housing with relevant housing agreements are exempt from the CAC guidelines. However, uh, tourism accommodation units and commercial area is often assessed by CAC. So following a strict interpretation of the guidelines, uh, the staff kind of estimate the value at about $226,000. However, again, these are guidelines and, and often uh, open to negotiations and other things uh, with the developer. Uh, engagement and communication, we'll be looking at a for, full referral process uh, following first re uh, reading if the application does proceed that far. Um, it's fairly significant rezoning, so additional notification on social media, talk to Fino and other district channels may be appropriate. Um, and staff 
recommend that we hold some sort of a public consultation, uh, whether that is a public hearing or, or whether um, uh, there's another, you know, sort of an open house or some other opportunity for in-person public consultation as this is a pretty significant application. Uh, there's a bit of a history to this property uh, and it'll certainly impact the town uh, for, for a long time in the future. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we'll, maybe we'll talk about next steps. If permission to proceed is granted, basically we'll, we'll take any comments that the council have today and work with the applicant to draft a bylaw to bring back to council for consideration and uh, hopefully find something supportable in the year. Uh, and just as a note, the existing temporary use permit does expire in 2025. So while it's not uh, imminent, it's, it is uh, a bit of a timeline to be considered of uh, when, when considering this application. Uh, so that was quite a bit of information and talking on my part. I'll open it up to any questions and comments and uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Thick. So this, uh, this, this section will open up for questions for clarity for Mr. Thick. And then if there's any comments after that, what we'll do is we'll, we'll allow Mr. Thick to sit down and we can have comments. And we can always call, uh, we can always call on staff for information. Uh, having said that, uh, questions from council for Mr. Thick. Yes, Councillor Thomas. I was just thinking. She said, Councillor Thomas sent me a letter, and I was just thinking about so about this. Okay, we should turn the name backwards. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was just about the number of staff versus tourist rooms in the developer's report, and then the report to council. There were two different numbers pretty significantly. So I was just wondering where the change came about or which number we should be looking at. Um, thank you for the question uh, through the chair. Uh, the applicant originally had a slightly different plan that they, they initially applied for. Um, there was that was uh, represented by the numbers that were in, in the I believe it's appendix one. Um, uh, and then staff had some further conversations with them and, and tried to reduce that number of tourism accommodation units, uh, something that staff felt at least a little bit more confident bringing towards council uh, for permission to proceed. Um, so, so the actual application, uh, the actual consideration today for council is the 22 units, not the, I believe, 30 or 2 units, exactly. However, the, the application that was received, and, and there's a lot of the information in there is very relevant, um, but that, that portion of the application is, is no longer relevant. I think um, staff made a note about that in, uh, I believe, uh, page four of the reports, um, just kind of the last uh, paragraph. It just says that the letter of intent refers to an older version of the site plan. Um, however, the other details uh, within that letter of intent are still relevant, which is why staff chose to include those in appendix. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor McMaster. Uh, I just have two questions, which I think I know the answers for, but just for clarification, this all went through and then the, the applicant sold the property. And the next buyer came in and said, well, I don't want to do staff housing, and I'm going to convert that tourist accommodation to high-end tourist accommodation. Would they be allowed to do that under the zoning that's been applied for? Likely not. Uh, so staff would be, uh, the zone that we would probably write would refer uh, back to the to the uh, the proposed site plan uh, further, like we've been doing with, with uh, numerous other applications as of late. Uh, we'd probably have a, a bit of a development agreement towards between, that would be finalized and signed between third and fourth reading if we make it that far. That development agreement would, would probably be uh, a covenant uh, independent of the housing agreement. So the housing agreement would, would you know, kind of have a requirement for the, uh, property to be providing a certain amount of, of, of staff accommodation before they maybe are even allowed to run the tourism accommodation. Uh, and then the covenant would, would restrict uh, perhaps the form and character or would restrict the use to kind of what's being proposed under this application. Um, so the idea is to, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of remove any uh, potential for, for speculative development, I guess, in this case. And so that would be something that we'd bring back for council's consideration, of course, as, as we move through this process. Um, but yes, that would be something that we would be looking to, to not allow or to mitigate as best as possible. Okay. And then a second question, which is kind of minor. Uh, um, we talk about water modeling. I know that's fairly expensive to do. Uh, would we be doing it and who would be paying for it? Or? Um, so we, right now we have a, a water model that's uh, the, the, I guess, intellectual 
property or it's a proprietary model model that is owned by by an engineering firm so anytime we have to use it we pay for it uh, this you know i, I think councilor master understands that just to explain for, for other counselors um that cost is, is shifted to the developer um and, and typically for what it's worth it's, it's about a thousand dollars so in the grand scheme of development it's you know a thousand dollars a thousand dollars but it's not that much uh, when we're considering these kinds of elements and that gives us a better understanding of how our, our, not necessarily our water capacity, but our water infrastructure is going to be impacted by the development. Good. That's all I've got for now. Any further, further questions? Go ahead. I just sure. have one more um, point of clarity that I'm not sure if I understand. So between two points, it was a uh, tourism building permit would go before staff, but then part of the property or the entire property would be exempt from the CAC guidelines, given that it would be counted as um, accommodation or like uh, affordable housing. So uh, where does that fit in with the building permit, I guess? Yeah, thanks very much. I, I think I kind of understand what you're getting at. So through the chair, um, uh, I, uh, the way the way our community amenity contribution guidelines work again it's just a guideline so it just kind of provides us a, a bit of an idea of, of where we might want to end up in terms of a community amenity contribution from a developer um, but we actually have a, a particular kind of exemption I guess within within the CAC guidelines for any um, accommodation units that are subject to a housing agreement or, or an appropriate housing agreement so typically um, historically what we've done is is when uh, a developer, um, whether that's a resort building new staff accommodation or the THC or, or anyone else for that matter, uh, build staff accommodation units and they're subject to a housing agreement which ensures that they're going to be rented long term, that they're going to only be rented to staff living and working within the district of Tofino and often they have rent caps associated with them as well. Um, if they're subject to that sort of a housing agreement, usually we say, okay, well, the, the amenity that the, the community is getting is this housing. Really. So, so an additional amenity ask on top of that is is uh, maybe not reasonable. However, that's only one part of this development proposal. The other part of it is, is tourism accommodation. And uh, the CAC guidelines kind of uh, recommend that we look to uh, you know, kind of acquire uh, approximately $10,000 for each new tourism accommodation unit that's that's uh, approved through a rezoning. Um, so those that aspect of the development would, would be subject to the CAC guidelines and CACs are collected through the rezoning. Um, I think I think maybe uh, this this may not be what you're getting at, but DCCs are the other aspect of, of uh, money that comes in, and those are usually assessed at building permit. So uh, DCCs are actually governed under bylaw; they're not really negotiation at all. It's just you know, here's how much you have to pay in order to build this because this offsets the cost of pipes in the ground uh, throughout the community, uh, and those are what what is assessed at, at building permit. The CACs are, are much more. And I understand that's a lot of kind of, kind of planning jargon and acronyms and things like no, that. No, it was it was good. Thank you. That was my question. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Go ahead. Um, I would like to ask um, about with respect to our, the riparian zone and close proximity. I was wondering if any assurances have been made about the dark sky policy. Um, so at this point, no. This is something that we would probably like to be considering. Um, again, I would I would kind of reference that idea of a development agreement that we often uh, kind of uh, oblige developers to to sign and so within our zoning bylaw we have you know kind of specific things that we can request and specific things that we can't um, um, and then we would have what we call a covenant which is a bit more of a uh, a precise agreement I suppose that says you know within within this development you know here's what your zone says but then here's some additional um, requirements for that zone and that might be something like you know the the, the final build out has to resemble what you've been proposing through this rezoning um, all lighting has to comply with the dark sky policy um, you know maybe you have to put your driveway somewhere or have a have a you know a, a gate or a fence somewhere so a lot of these things that are too fine grain maybe for a zone itself we kind of in, include in these development agreements so that'd be something that we would like to include um, uh, in that in that legal agreement should the application move forward. And then I have one more question. Um, I was just noticing that in the conceptual plan that they put forward there was a greenhouse and then so I was wondering if they were going to supply any um, water catchment for watering of the greenhouse or out, outside water use? Mm. Um, thank you for the question through the chair. Um, uh, I, I believe that uh, that has been something that, that is considered by Epkin. I think 
uh, one of the things that the applicant has noted that they would like to do is include, you know, kind of opportunities for residents to have, you know, shared garden spaces and those kinds of things. And then catchment systems are, are something that we've kind of initially discussed. Um, including that in a zone, again, I feel like is a little bit sort of fine grained. And so maybe if this is something that is uh, important to council, it's something that I can take back the applicant and say, you know, this is something that should be included in your site plan. Um, and, and it may be something that we include in, in that legal agreement that I alluded to earlier. Um, yeah, the, the other thing I would notice that we often do um, have applicants come forward uh, with, with plans for uh, water recycling or water collection. Um, uh, however, they're, they're really nice, but they're, they're kind of difficult for the, the district to sort of assess without um, having a fully engineered plan that's going to replace at least part of the, the burden on district infrastructure. So um, again, I think it's a really wonderful idea, but to use it as any sort of uh, uh, replacement for, for the water that's going to be required by the development um, uh, is probably not appropriate, but, but in terms of just maintaining outdoor plants and outdoor spaces, that's a really wonderful idea. And I'm more than happy to, to kind of work with the applicant to ensure it's included in the development program. Are there questions from council? I have uh, one question here. It's about uh, density. Now, in the previous uh, temporary use permits for the property, density factored very significantly for both staff and council. And I believe uh, the previous TOP was, uh, or the, the application before was uh, for 45 units and 70 residents. And at that time, that was considered uh, uh, unsupportable for density. Now, it looks to me like that this application exceeds that density, but I haven't really seen any uh, comments on density. And I wondered if, uh, if you could just speak to that and, and maybe clarify uh, the density of this proposed application compared to, uh, to other areas uh, in close proximity or in all of the Yeah, certainly. Thanks for the question, Mayor Law. Um, I don't think there's any any doubt that this would be a very dense development for Tofino, um, no matter where you put it, uh, whether it's downtown or elsewhere. Um, uh, regarding the temporary use permits, I think some of the hesitation that staff had with with increasing more density there was uh, those temporary use permits were you know uh, more uh, tailored towards trailers and camping um, and and structures that were not part uh, or considered to be uh, you know regulated under the BC Building Code. So there was a bit of a safety aspect to that. Um, also, the primary consideration for the granting of, of those TUPs was because we needed staff accommodation. Um, um, and and uh, rather than kind of actually put forward a proposal like we're considering today, the, the owner at that time said, okay, well, here's your staff accommodation that will provide, which is, which is trailers and then spots to park the trailers. Um, and so uh, it, it, while that was, uh, you know, a very useful um, uh, you know, form of accommodation to kind of as, as a bit of a band-aid or as a bridge gap measure. Um, part of the reason why the density was reduced was because uh, the affordable housing at 700 Sharp Road came online and that was kind of deemed as a bit of a replacement for, for some of those units. Um, uh, so I think there's a, the other reason that I think uh, comes, comes to mind for me initially, at least uh, for, for those, uh, the, the density concerns with trailers, at least is the safety associated with them. Again, they're not governor of the BC building code and having numerous trailers together presents a very real fire hazard. Um, so I, I would say that's kind of where staff um, sort of initially kind of had some hesitation around uh, the, the density that was being proposed for those TP. Um, further, um, trying to think of the appropriate way to kind of put this, but but that sort of development is not exactly um, the type of development that we were we were looking to see on that property or hoping to, to see. Rather than uh, seeing some sort of a reasonable you know housing proposal put forward, it was kind of like okay, well here's a bunch of trailers, uh, how's that? And so it's difficult for us to kind of get behind high density trailers as opposed to uh, an actual proposal that that does present uh, some sort of uh, you know a uh, bit of a higher quality housing development. Um, However, all that being said, this is certainly a, a significant uh, increase in density. Um, uh, and, and for all the reasons that I mentioned in the presentation, you know, outside of the, the town core within a tsunami hazard area should be carefully considered. Uh, my understanding is that all the buildings will be uh, compliant or they're obliged to be compliant with our coastal flooding bylaw. So the, the lowest port part of the habitable surface will be uh, at least at you know, probably six to seven meters uh, geodetic elevation. I can't remember exactly what the, what the required elevation is at that point. Um, and then uh, another thing that I think staff have, have mentioned to the applicants and would like to work on is, is sort of, 
you know, how are we going to consider tsunami evacuation in this particular case with this, this density there? Um, uh, and, and what are the, the best ways that we can mitigate these sorts of things? Um, uh, again, I think I mentioned it in the in the report, but we don't really have a risk matrix established for, for you know, how we consider these kinds of things. Our OCP has said, well, we, we really don't want to develop in there, but uh, for better or for worse, this is a, a legitimate housing proposal in that area. Um, so it presents, a, you know, it's, it's not a slam dunk and it presents a bit of an issue for council. There's, there's no question about that. Um, however, it is something that does appear to be worthy of consideration. Um, one last comment I would make is that there are, uh, two other fairly significant proposals uh, within that area that look to be moving forward. Um, um, well, certainly the, the Tlokit First Nations moving forward with their campground uh, right next door, which which adds some significant density there. And then there's uh, another commercially zoned property up the road that is, is also looking to develop um, in a significant way. So uh, th there is uh, significant development pressure on that area that will add density, um, whether or not this rezoning application moves forward. Thank you. Okay, you can sit down, Mr. Beck. We're going to let you off the hot seat there, and uh, now we're going to go around uh, around the council table. This is a good time because we haven't actually made a recommendation yet, and uh, at this point, I think it's a good idea we can have a discussion, and uh, we could just go around and take turns. Let's start with you, Councillor Sloan. Well, I think we addressed a lot of the concerns through all of our questions. So um, one of the other concerns I had was like the degradation of the road with all the, I mean, I, I think it's ideal that we have everyone arrive not in vehicles, but it's potential to have 86 vehicles if everyone shows up in a vehicle. And I know like staff at COM often their surfers or they have a vehicle to get to the surf. So to me, I think that they're gonna all be parking up and down that road. It's gonna degrade the ditches and then it will be district's issue. To maintain that. Super. I'm gonna. I, I mean, we all go next, just so we can give a little bit of uh, the new folks how to how we generally. Oh, did I do it wrong? No, it's all right. I should. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. So this is what I would say for this one. Here, here I'll give. I'll give you my my two bits. And I, I would say that uh, that I am against granting permission to proceed uh, for this uh, for this application. And then I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why. Uh, this is my understanding: is that uh, the way I read the OCP uh, is that uh, uh, there's a significant, uh, both in letter and intent, uh, focus on on not uh, building uh, commercial accommodation, which this is and has a significant amount of it. Uh, we we've, uh, we've got latent zoning out there in the hundreds that if people were to to develop what they're already allowed to develop without rezoning we would be uh, we'd be short of water uh right away if we're not already short of water and uh and so for me uh allowing this application to go forward granting permission to proceed with the 22 units uh or or any commercial units on there it means that we have to even look even harder about, about dezoning what people already have. And so that, that's a significant concern for me. Um, what else is a concern for me? The density, I think, is, uh, is exceptional. I think this would be the highest, the way I read it, uh, looking at past reports, this would be the highest, most dense uh, development in all of Tofino. And certainly is, is not in the downtown core uh, where, uh, where the OCP uh, specifically directs that kind of density. Uh, also, there's one thing I, I wanted to point out. Uh, it is for building. The argument is that uh, the 22 commercial units are for offsetting the cost of staff economy. We all know that 22 unit resort with a cafe would require a significant number of employees. And I did look at that. Uh, and I think generally speaking, in the middle of, mid range of a resort, it's one to one. So one uh, one employee per per room. No, I don't know if it's going to be 0.8 or 1.5 for this one. I don't know, but it would be a significant number of employees, which would require staff accommodation. Uh, and even at one-to-one, -one, you just take 22 off the 59 staff accommodations, and we really got the staff accommodation in the 30s uh, if, we, if we take that offset. So for me, uh, that's, uh, 
that's also a no-go. So that's that's just a couple ideas from me why I actually personally would uh, would at this point in the in the conversation with council not support uh, granting permission to proceed and and hope that the uh, hope that the applicant comes back with with something uh, a little more powerful to me. So that's mine. That's that's my pitch. I can move it on to uh, any other council. But like I said, I haven't decided. It's just right. this is where I'm at. Councilor Steer. Thank you, Mayor Law. Well, you um, uh, you probably read my notes then, it sounds like. Um, I, I won't be able to support uh, permission to proceed as well, based on many of the factors that uh, Mayor Law has pointed out. And I think uh, through the OCP and, and the, the tourist accommodation has become the lowest priority. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't even use the word priority at all in, in there. So uh, first of all, that uh, was, was a big game changer uh, in this. Um, the additional um, development outside of the village containment area you alluded to where we've directed most of our density. Um, once again, um, this is a very, very dense um, uh, proposal. Um, the other big one for me, and I, and I think uh, Mr. Thicke had pointed out in the report, is that we've put a lot of work and effort into our tsunami inundation uh, work, and it's clearly identified in this area, as well as our coastal risk assessment, uh, an area that is, and I know that there are ways to mitigate, but I think when we make these plans and then we um, have this information and then we uh, allow such density, um, to me, uh, in my opinion, I would feel negligent uh, in doing that. Um, the other one, um, as was alluded to by uh, Councilor McMaster, uh, we in uh, August of this year, we had a uh, water system overview. And within that overview, it was pointed out clearly that we risk manage for an eight to 12 week period uh, in the summertime. And one of the primary draws on that is the tourist accommodation uh, sector. And once again, I would feel uh, personally negligent in approving uh, further tourism accommodation. Um, uh, that would be a draw on that uh, particular resource that we are still struggling to um, uh, address uh, for that risk management period. Um, uh, Mayor Law also uh, alluded to the latent um, uh, in the C5 zoning, there are still quite a number of tourist accommodation units that are available to be uh, uh, developed in, uh, that is still out there. And I don't remember the exact number, but I do know it is fairly significant still. So for all of those reasons, um, I won't be able to support moving forward. I am very supportive of the idea of staff accommodation. And as I understand, it is an important aspect for our community. Um, for that seasonal employment, it would certainly benefit the uh, the applicant in, uh, in this particular uh, case. And I would hope that the applicant would can come back with, uh, as uh, in the words of our mayor, uh, a more palatable um, uh, proposal, because I would really like to support uh, the development of, of some form of staff accommodation uh, in, in Tofino and in this particular area. So I'll leave it at that. And... Uh, in, in for brevity's sake, <laughs> I have more, but I, I won't go on here. I have more too. Councillor McMaster. I, uh, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I, I mean, the plus side is the staff accommodation, but then there are so many negatives. Um, we were all watching the news this summer, and I kept on watching people that had, had their homes destroyed saying, Why do council allow us to build it? And here we are looking at something where we've already said we shouldn't be building. Uh, I don't like the idea of having um, a cafe or a restaurant. Uh, I know it's a small size, but we see the volume that uh, Taco Fino or Wildside uh, goes through. I don't want to see a line of customers going in up there. There's certainly not enough parking, as was alluded to. And I think uh, a lot more work's got to be done on this for me to approve it. Okay, that's for sure. All right. Um, I think that I'll start with positive impressions from this application. Um, I did like the idea of the geared towards a lower cost accommodation, even though it's outside the village core. I think it is beneficial in a way because the people who ideally are not driving and taking the bus are not also able to drive their rental surfboards to Chesterman's. So it would provide a hostel style potential accommodation in that area. 
And I think that it's still, it's still a very significant number of rooms. However, in what I would prefer to see more residential or, tour, or uh, staff accommodations. So perhaps if the balance was shifted slightly less tourism rooms in balance or just decreasing volume on that property. I think that given we already have people living there, and we've had people living there for a very long time. If we were to build in this space, at least we would be giving them safer places to live. And so those are my impressions. And I feel, I would say on the low end of favorable, I think there is a lot of work on this application that I think it has potential if a few things were changed. Um, I'm not wholly opposed to it, but I'm not in favor of it today. Okay, and I do have, uh, I do have, uh, I received communication from Councillor Thomas, uh, who was also not in favor of permission to proceed for many of the same reasons that uh, councillors have, have spoken to today. So seeing that, I look into council, I think that there's, uh, I think there's a significant majority uh, opposition to granting permission to proceed at this time. So, um, now here's a question for staff. Do we need a recommendation? through the chair uh, because staff have presented a recommendation uh, in favor or basically proposing uh, an action uh, we would be nice for staff to have an action for council for staff to go back to the developer the applicant uh, indicating council's decision yeah that's the th that's the track i mean we could say uh, the recommendation could be that uh, that staff be not granted permission to proceed with this uh, further review of this rezoning application uh, based on um, comments made in council, uh, nothing. No, just the decision of council um, is sufficient. Um, yeah, go ahead, just, just as a question of clarity for myself, in this particular case, if the uh, the recommendation that was brought forward onto the table and it was just defeated, would that be sufficient? Uh, through the chair, in in terms of minutes, um, it would reflect that, yes. Uh, however, it's not really uh, determining a decision way forward for staff. So I think it would be significant for staff to have a recommendation that indicates either the application has been yeah. uh, I I denied or, or just, I think what you had suggested there was staff not be granted permission to proceed would be sufficient. And then Councillor, uh, sorry, uh, please, please chime in here. Thanks to the chair, I think, I think it would be uh, useful for staff to either, um, for, for council to either pass a resolution uh, indicating that the application is denied or that it's deferred until uh, such time as the applicant can review their plan and bring something forward that, that may be uh, more supportive. Um, uh, I'm not sure which way to proceed at this point. I can't offer advice there, but I think one of those two uh, approaches may be uh, most straightforward for both staff and the applicant. Sure. I, I wouldn't mind uh, deferring this uh, until, uh, you know, the applicant and staff uh, come back with uh, an option more amenable to the discussion. But normally, I mean, normally in this, we have we have a couple of uh, different options here. So I don't have any options. <laughs> so, that's okay. That's okay. So we're kind of yeah. Well, there you go. Let's, we're going to go on the fly here. So uh, um, uh, that uh, well, then we can make the recommendation that uh, staff uh, that permission to proceed be deferred uh, until uh, I don't know. I, I, honestly, I'm a little stuck here, but uh, we're not supposed to do this on the fly. But uh, <laughs> But this is all good. It's all in line. To the mayor, I've just um, drafted what I think you just said here, uh, that permission to proceed be deferred to staff um, for further review on the rezoning application for 1141 Pacific Rim Highway. And then we will not include anything mentioning in the public hearing. Look at the council. That's fine by me. 
I'll make that motion. Okay, will you uh, read it out one more time so that uh, Council Steer can make uh, make that motion? Yes, um, that permission to proceed be deferred for further review of the rezoning application for 1141 Pacific Rim Highway. So moved. Second. Second by Council Member Master. Any further comments from Council? Seeing none, we call a question. All in favor? Uh, none opposed. Motion's carried. Thank you. Now, 10.2, temporary use permit. Bring that, Councillor Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, actually, uh, we can bring them in, but then just hold off a sec, because I think that uh, Councillor Anderson may declare another conflict of interest. So then I have a one minute recess. And let's have a, let's have a two minute recess yeah. while we uh, <laughs> find Councillor Anderson. <laughs>
Okay, we're reconvening from recess. We have uh, 10.2. We have a temporary use permit to Fino Seaweed for 1182 Pacific Highway Beaches area. And just uh, before you may start, maybe the law. I once again <laughs> have to declare a conflict of interest to the proximity of my business. I hold a lease at the same address as the uh, applicant uh, or the the, TU, the temporary use permit. And the temporary use permit could reasonably be deemed to impact positively or negatively my business interests at the property. Thank you, Councilor Adams. Awesome. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Zay. Thank you, Mayor Law. Uh, hello again, Mayor and Council. Uh, this presentation is related to the uh, staff report for the temporary use permit for Tofino Seaweed uh, at 82 Pacific Rim Highway. Uh, by way of introduction, the application was received uh, earlier this year on May 27th. Um, uh, staff had been in, in conversation with the applicants uh, for, for numerous months leading up to that. Uh, staff had uh, requested that the applicant actually defer their application um, uh, due to the provisions of the uh, cannabis temporary use permit policy that was uh, in effect at that point in time. Uh, however, uh, since that has recently uh, been uh, amended by council, the application could be now considered. Uh, so this is the second cannabis TP application that was received for this location. Um, the first was issued by council in 2019, uh, but lapsed before the business was able to open. Uh, so this is kind of another uh, attempt at starting uh, a very similar, not quite the same, but a similar business. Uh, the location along Pacific Rim Highway, that's uh, 1182 Pacific Rim Highway. It's the location currently of a small grocery store, as well as a, a surf shop and some other businesses. Uh, the proposal is to operate a non-medical cannabis retail store out of an existing commercial space on property. Uh, the commercial space is located on the second floor of the existing larger building on the property. Uh, taking a quick look through our policies and bylaws, um, uh, it's worth noting that there are provincial requirements associated with, with cannabis retail. This is under the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act. Uh, there are actually specific requirements related to the uh, display and, and viewability of, of product, as well as the marketing of product and of cannabis products uh, and similar sorts of things. So there are some provincial controls uh, related to this type of retail enterprise. Uh, looking at our official community plan, there aren't any really comments specific to, to cannabis retail. However, there is support for small businesses uh, as well as commercial activity in, in the proposed area. Um, looking at the uh, cannabis retail policy that was recently reconsidered by council and amended, uh, there's nothing in the policy that prevents council from considering this application. So it is in line with the uh, proposed acceptable locations uh, within the policy, and it is within the uh, three-store limit that has been established for the community. Uh, the existing zoning is highway commercial on the property, so there is uh, permission for commercial retail use on the property currently. However, no cannabis retail, uh, cannabis and alcohol sales are, are a bit of a, a specific or particular permission, uh, permission pardon me, and do not, uh, do not fall under the uh, definition for standard commercial retail. Uh, so this is our, our kind of TUP policy framework that we use to evaluate temporary use permits. Uh, TUPs, similar to development variance permits, often don't have a lot of direction from, from existing policy, uh, existing zoning, or, or, or official community plans. So we use this uh, framework to give us at least a little bit of a, an idea of how to kind of somewhat objectively evaluate these, these uh, applications. So uh, the, the application does provide for a short-term land use opportunity. Uh, this is uh, cannabis retail is not permitted currently on the property under the zoning. Um, and the TUP will allow the district to kind of contemplate whether this is an appropriate location for, for cannabis retail and, and maybe uh, uh, provide some background and, and information should a, a zoning application be received to, to kind of uh, allow this use more permanently. Uh, in terms of diversification of the economy, this is another thing that temporary use permits are occasionally used for. Um, it will allow the applicant to participate in the cannabis retail industry. Um, currently, we only have one cannabis retail store within the community. Um, so the, while it's still a retail use, uh, there, there is a, a bit of a, an element of a different, uh, different type of retail being, being proposed by this TUP. Uh, as far as innovation goes, um, uh, you know, cannabis retail is a relatively new form of commercial retail, but really the core 
is not uh, is essentially the same where it's a, it's a you know commercial retail of a specific product uh, at a specific location. As far as being a bridge to a permanent change of use, um, should the TUP be successful and the business continue and, and, and staff and council be continually in support of the, uh, of the business, um, uh, staff do anticipate that the applicant will in the future apply to rezone the property to or rezone that portion of the property, I should say, to allow cannabis retail. Uh, balancing public and private interests, um, the applicant will enjoy the ability to uh, you know, offer cannabis sale for or cannabis for retail sale. Uh, and the public will have an um, additional retail opportunity within the community. Um, so we're looking at an opportunity to, to somewhat balance, you know, uh, is this good for the community or does this offer any sort of opportunity for the general public? Um, and, and what does it offer to the, to the applicants? Possibly a bit more of a private interest. Uh, as far as impact on the environment, staff anticipate them to be uh, negligible. Um, the location is already cleared. The structure is already built, uh, and, and the, the location itself is already there. Um, no further environmental uh, impacts are anticipated uh, from, from the operation of the store outside of standard uh, commercial considerations, which is you know, kind of the, the shipping and, and delivery of product uh, and packaging, those kinds of things. Uh, looking to achieve a level of compatibility with the surrounding developments. Um, the existing property is a commercial property. This is, uh, again, a commercial use. It's a very specific commercial use, but it is in line with uh, many of the other commercial retail or service retail uses that are, are allowed and, and currently existing on the property. Uh, a few planning consider considerations as far as traffic access and parking. Uh, no changes are anticipated. Uh, there's significant parking present on the site. Um, that is usually available. Um, three reserved spaces will be required through this TP uh, to service this particular location. So three spaces will be required to be reserved within the existing parking on the property uh, for, for the use of this particular uh, retail, um, retail store. Uh, signage, we don't have any current details, uh, but the, any signage that is, is put up will have to conform to provincial regulations as well as the DOT sign bylaw. Uh, upon speaking with the applicant, um, I learned that the, the proposed sign is fairly discreet and will likely be attached to the existing fascia and, and be kind of a, a fairly standard uh, white lettering against a, 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 you know, some sort of a solid color background. Uh, as far as security goes, uh, generally the applicant is intending to follow provincial regulations. Uh, the security proposal is the same as the original application for the store. Um, I believe the security infrastructure has actually been installed. So there'll be a full camera system uh, kind of monitoring uh, all areas of the store as well as the outside area. There'll also be uh, locked cabinet storage areas for cannabis products as well as, as uh, various biometric locks uh, associated with entering and exiting the store. Uh, looking at a couple of the important aspects of the, the cannabis retail policy, one is community health. Staff don't actually have any significant concerns with community health. Um, uh, sort of the, the primary uh, ideas around community health are to uh, ensure that any cannabis retail uh, doesn't occur in a place where minors congregate or, or is close to any other sensitive uses. Um, there aren't any, uh, you know, sensitive uses is often kind of uh, defined as uh, access to alcohol or, or other um, uh, similar, uh, you know, uh, recreational substances. Um, or, or locations close to, you know, such as the playground or an elementary school, um, those kinds of things. Uh, the closest place to purchase alcohol is actually at Hotel Z, which is a bit more of a, a sit-down restaurant that's about 500 meters away. The closest place where you can uh, purchase alcohol for takeout is at the Tofino Brewing Company on Industrial Way. I believe that's about a kilometer and a half away. Um, it is uh, adjacent to a uh, residential neighborhood and in an area where families often congregate. However, due to the location of the Unit on the second floor and the minimal signage uh, staff do not feel that this is going to be uh, a, a significant threat to the health of, of youth in our community by uh, at least from a location standpoint. Uh, the next uh, consideration that staff wanted to mention would be the idea of social benefits. Uh, this is something that is um, less strictly defined in our current uh, cannabis policy, but still an important part of that policy. Um, uh, staff note that the proposed social benefits are significantly reduced from the original application that was granted to TUP, uh, and largely at this point consists of the installation of a solar panel system that, that uh, powers the SOAR. Um, uh, I think in the report, staff made a couple comments about this, but it, it may be worth noting that the existing cannabis store um, that was uh, permitted under the, the older cannabis retail policy and then under kind of the initial intake uh, has uh, provided numerous social benefits that were outlined in their initial application, and, and they have actually uh, made good on those, on those promises. 
looking at community engagement, uh, neighbor notifications went out on November 10th and 11th uh, earlier this month. Uh, the Westerly News uh, had an advertisement placed in it on November 16th, advertising the general public of the application. Uh, there were three responses received uh, from one individual representing uh, different organizations or different properties, I suppose you'd say, uh, and all of the three responses were in favor of the application. Uh, so staff at this point uh, are recommending approval uh, after, you know, kind of reviewing things through the temporary use permit policy, as well as, as seeing that the application is in general compliance with the, uh, the cannabis retail policy. Um, uh, of course, this is a different application than what was received initially. Uh, however, it does comply with many of the uh, Many of the kind of policies in there and ways we can see these types of applications. Uh, if there are any questions or comments at this point, I'd be happy to speak to them. Thank you, Mr. Thay. Looking to council for questions. Questions from Mr. Thay. Councilor Sloman. Through the chair. Um, I was just wondering um, with the ice cream shop where kids could potentially congregate and the park in Ocean Park, is that a concern for public health? Uh, thank you for your question through the chair. Uh, certainly, that is something that that staff considered. Um, particularly, uh, you know, the Ocean Park neighborhood is is often a neighborhood with with many young families and uh, a lot of younger and, and young teenage kids as well. Um, many of the businesses, such as Kid and Coop, the ice cream store, Beaches Grocery, even Taco Fino, uh, Wild Side are, are often areas for for youth and young adults to congregate. So there is um, certainly a uh, sense of use in that area. Um, why staff? Uh, I guess at this point have um, uh, felt that, it, that they're slightly less of a concern is, is uh, A, due to the location of, the, of, the, of the, the actual unit, which is on the second floor. There's kind of a, an outside stair walk up to get there. Um, there's also numerous uh, provincial restrictions in terms of, of signage and advertisement, as well as uh, there will be no ability to view inside the actual, this is a provincial regulation, but there'll be no ability to view inside the actual store. There'll have to be uh, some sort of wrap or banner on the actual exterior windows. Um, and then beyond that, uh, typically um, the, uh, the, the sort of Ocean Park neighborhood and, and the, the larger commercial area of outside break is, is often an area where, where youth are with their families. And so there's less of an opportunity um, for uh, for, for young children to be kind of exposed involuntarily, or or you know, kind of uh, you know, by being on their own and, and moving into uh, that store, or in, in you know, direct proximity as well. Other questions? Question, Councilor Steer. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, in the uh, initial application back in 2019, that uh, that we were supportive of, um, one of the prime reasons I and, and I'll speak for myself was the social benefits aspect of the applications. And so when that application came forward, there were numerous social benefits that uh, that they had um, had in their application. And some of the significant ones, of course, housing and, and living wage, I think, are two of the big ones that come to mind. Um, and so uh, for granting that uh, at that time, those considerations were very important. Um, but this time around, um, there seems to be a retraction of those um, social benefits. And, and granted, uh, we have gone through a review process, and, and that's not as significant a uh, factor as it was in, in the first review process. Um, but that being said, I wonder if there's any, um, in conversation with the, uh, with the applicant, uh, if there was any reasons given for why the retraction of those uh, of those benefits at this time in place, because that would be is an important consideration for me at this point. Um, certainly, yeah. Thank you for the question uh, to the chair again, um, and, and I'll speak somewhat candidly. So, so please take my answer with a grain of salt, because I, this is a was a conversation I had with the applicants. Um, whether or not this is uh, you know the, the specific answer that you're looking for or not, but. Um, Essentially, the applicant noted that one of the reasons for the initial failure of the business was uh, that they had potentially overpromised on the social benefits, um, and and the the group that was initially uh, together to form the business was was no longer together and able to deliver those benefits. Um, so the the applicant now is, is one of the initial members uh, of, of that group, but is essentially operating on their own at this point and doesn't have the capacity to offer those same social benefits. Um, and and I, I uh, had a conversation with the applicant about this and I kind of mentioned that this may be uh, something that comes up as a bit of a concern. Um, however, uh, again, as the application currently uh, is not something that is out of line with the with the, uh, the, the cannabis retail policy that, that is enforced at this point, uh, you know, the staff are okay to bring it forward, at least at this point. Um, 
Um, but I would say, yeah, to, to answer your question as simply as possible, I think it was just something that they, they couldn't really deliver on. And so um, particularly as this is now kind of gone back to just one individual looking to, to kind of start the store, uh, I think they're, they're cautious about how much they're able to promise and, and actually deliver at, at this point in time. Okay. I have no questions or comments. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments from council. We're uh, generally in favor. Should we read the recommendation? I can move the recommendation. I move that staff be authorized to approve the temporary use permit attached to Appendix 1 to the staff report of temporary use permit to Fino Seaweed, 1182 Pacific Rim Highway, dated November 22. 2022 for a period of three years, and that council recommends liquor and two, cannabis two regulations. Just oh. I have it as two different recommendations. Let's, okay. let's move that first one. <laughs> we have a seconder for that. Councilor Sloman, second. Any further comments from council? Call the question. All in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion is carried. Okay, go ahead. Here. Right, go. Move that council recommends liquor and cannabis regulation branch issue the license to West Coast Cannabis Store subject to the hours of operation ending by 8 p.m. due to the proximity of the location to residential areas. Second for that. Councillor Slope, any further comments from council? Seeing none, uh, calling the question. All in favor? None opposed, motions carried. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank. Yeah. Any other options? That's nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was something missing. I was like, <laughs> kind of alone. There we go. <laughs> All right, 10.3, we've got uh, a bunch of committee appointments, council member appointments to go through. So um, we have an initial recommendation here. Now, do we have a report from, uh, okay, so I sorry, there's no report. We have Ms. Larson available for questions and clarification. Yeah, thank you, Mary, a lot. Um, if I may, um, I don't have a presentation for this report, um, but yeah, I'm available for questions or if you do require any clarification about anything. Um, it was a rather large report, um, so thank you for taking the time to read through it all. This is a report that comes back to Council annually um, mm -hmm. for review. This one is a little bit larger because with the general local election that just took place in October, all of Council's previous appointments reached the end of their term, and so all of the appointments that are required to be made to standing committees, select committees, and external bodies need to be uh, reappointed. Okay. Okay, perfect. So it's going to make take a little bit of time. We can debate each one, and uh, I've already had a little bit of a little bit of direction from some councillors. So, but uh, let's go right with the first recommendation, and that the uh, I recommend that the volunteer recognition standing committee of council be dissolved that the volunteer recognition awards be determined by council on an annual basis subject to nominations received from the community of Tofino. I have a second for that one. Second by Councillor Sawyer. All of, uh, any further comments from council? None. Call the question. All in favor? None opposed. Motion is carried. Now we have uh, select committee. Several. We have the first up is the design review panel. Uh, we have interest from Councillor Thomas. Who else is interested in the design review panel? Councillor Anderson, you were on. I was on it before. Would you uh, consider being an alternate? Do we have an alternate for that one? We yes, we are required to have an alternate for that one. Okay, perfect. I could be. <laughs> Okay, well, why don't, uh, if there's no objection, why don't I move that uh, Councillor Thomas be appointed to the design review panel 
and Councillor Anderson be appointed as alternate for a term ending earliest of council points and other council member. Council member ceased to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general local election. Any further comments from council? Oh, we say I need a seconder for that, actually. Second, second by Councillor Anderson. All, any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. I say it every time. We have the Public Art Advisory Committee. I have a little comment on this one. I, I was on the original Public Art Advisory Committee group. It was the best committee <laughs> I have ever, ever, ever been on. It was amazing. It was like the perfect committee. I got to say that. I just got to say that. But I, I'm the mayor, so I'm not going to jump on because I think, I think somebody else would get on there. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Anderson. I really enjoy being on that committee. <laughs> okay. Would you, would you like to maintain your position? I, I would, unless uh, somebody has a burning desire to do that. No, yeah. anybody interested in uh, uh, let me just see if uh, why why don't I why don't I be the alternate? I guess I could be the alternate. unless somebody else wants to be the alternate. Anybody interested in it? It sounds cool, but I won't. Have no, I, I am just I'm just I'm, gonna, I am, I'm an ex I'm an ex officio member of everything, so I can just show up. But uh, <laughs> any takers? Okay, I'll be the alternate. I'm like talking yeah. in my It's great. It, it hasn't done anything for a little while, but when it does, yeah. Okay. Be good. I'm pumping you up. Uh, Vermont. Okay. Uh, then I'll move that Councillor Anderson be appointed to the uh, the Public Art Advisory Committee, and Councillor Sloman be appointed as alternate for a term ending earliest of council points. Another council member. The council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting of the year of a general election. Second. Second by Councillor Steer. All in favor. Okay, that motion's carried. We have the Events, Arts, Culture, and Heritage Each Committee. Now I have got Councillor Sloman is interested in this. Anybody else interested in this? Just, uh, I'm interested. I, um, I could be alternate though. Well, you guys could. You guys are going to get swapped for this one. Then. Okay. All right. Excellent. Any further comment from Council before I read the motion? Okay, I move that uh, Councillor Sloman be appointed to the each committee and Councillor Anderson be appointed as alternate for a term ending earliest of council points. Another council member, the council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general election. Secretary, Secretary. Councillor Steer. No further comment, all in favor? None opposed, motions carried. We have Emergency Program Executive Committee. I have one interested counselor, Councillor Thomas, who has expressed some interest in this. I can sit as the alternate if, if that's okay. I've been involved with the program before and my background is in this work. So um I mean we can either do uh we can either do uh um I certainly don't alternate want to, yeah. or if not. Do you have a preference? No, I'll, I'll, I can be alternative. Okay, if, uh, well, let's do that. If there's, no, if there's no objection from council, I'll go ahead and do this then. I move that Councilor Thomas be appointed to the Emergency Program Executive Committee and Councilor Steer be appointed as an alternate for a term ending earliest of council appoints another council member. The council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of the general election. Any further comment from council? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion is carried. And finally, the Recreation Advisory Committee. Uh, I believe we have one. Councillor Sloman is interested in the Recreation Advisory Committee. Any other interest in, in Councillor? Oh, oh, yeah. Excellent. So, okay. If there's no objection, I'm going to go ahead and read that motion. I move that Councillor Sloman be appointed to the Recreation Advisory Committee, and that Councillor Steer be appointed as alternate for a term ending earliest of council points another council member. The council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general election. Second. Second by Councillor Steer. Any further comment? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion is carried. Now we move on to Topino Housing Corporation. Uh, I would like to sit on the Topino Housing Corporation. So I would like to do that. 
what are we, how many are we looking for on this? Well, I don't want space for the moment. Oh, so that's, yeah. okay, gotcha. Oh. Just, just asking because people expressed interest. Uh, and actually, uh, Councillor Sloven also expressed interest. Yeah, but you can have it. Okay. You can have it. Um, all right, then. That's okay. Everybody, no, seeing no objection because we can fight it out. It's it's okay. It wasn't hard to fight. Okay. Uh, then um, the Council requests Fino Housing Corporation Board consider appointing Mayor Law to fill the temporary vacancy on the Board of Directors until the next annual general meeting held in 2023. Seconder. Seconded Second. by Councillor Steer. Any further comment from Council? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motions carried. Municipal Insurance Association. Now, I know everybody's <laughs> written about this one. I was all like old or Councilor Anderson. No, um, <laughs> hey, if you want to hang out with people at UBC, hang out with these uh, folks because uh, it's fun. Conversation's not great. Does <laughs> anybody? Uh, I, I, it's a one-hour meeting about once a year at UBC. Well, exactly once a year at UBC. And after doing it for eight years, I'm still waiting for the exciting part. <laughs> um, I'm willing to, to keep on doing that. Who, who would like to be alternate? I could be alternate. You want to be alternate? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're in. You're in. Okay. So that's great then. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll move that Councillor Anderson be appointed to the Municip Municipal Insurance That's Association as the District of Tino's voting delegate. <laughs> and uh, Councillor Sawyer be appointed as alternate for terms ending the earliest of council appoints another council member. The council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general election. Second. Local election, sorry. Uh, seconded by Councillor Anderson, seeing the comments all in favor. And that motion is carried. None opposed. Vancouver Island Regional Library. Now I know that uh, two very interested parties have already discussed this. So, Councilor McMaster. Yeah, I'm going to be the principal, and what's the soil? It'll be the alternate. And I've said that if I don't get re-elected to the executive, I'm prepared to switch, and I'll put the alternate. Okay. Do we have any other comments from Council? Sounds good. Two thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. Well, then I'll move that. Councillor Master be appointed as trustee and Councillor Sawyer be appointed as alternate to the Vancouver Island Regional Library Board for trust of trustees beginning January 1st, 2023, for a term ending early sub council points on the council member. The council member ceases to hold office. The council member is removed for cause as provided under the Library Act, December 31st, 2023. Okay. Second by Councillor Steer. Any further comments from council? Saying none. All in favor? None of those motions carry. Uh, we have now the Tofino Harbor Authority. Councilor Steve. Since I've been there for, <laughs> uh, I would, uh, yeah, if that's okay, if there's nobody else interested, I will continue on with the Tofino Harbor Authority. Okay. Everybody will know, you guys will love it. <laughs> um, okay, well, saying that, there's no comment. Oh, that, uh, I'll move that. Councilor Steer be appointed to the Tofino Harbor Authority Board of Directors for the term ending earliest of council points on the council member. The council member ceases to hold office. The date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general election. Second, Councilor Sloman. Uh, further comment from council, seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion is carried. Doors of Tofino. Well, we've got. Uh, Couple interested in tourism to you know, I have myself and Councillor Sloman, but I think I am gonna I, I I'm tempted to to let you take it on if you're really keen. Yeah, I'll take it on. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay, well, I'm set settled then. Anybody else? Buying for tourism to Pino? I'd be happy to be alternate on that one. We don't and have we don't an alternate for this one. This is a um, it's a non-voting uh, member. There's only one. I don't think we have an alternate. Do we? No, we do not. Okay. 
right? Good. Okay. Uh, then I'll move that Councilor Sloman be appointed the district as the district of Tofino's representative, non-voting to the Tourism Tofino Board of Directors for a term ending the earliest of council appoints another council member. The council member ceases to hold up as the Tourism Tofino annual general meeting in April 2023. So you're actually just kind of sneaking in there and it's going to come up again in the spring. Going to go to the Christmas party and that's going to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, seconder, Councillor Steer, further comment from Council, seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motions carried. Recommendation number eight, Wick and Inish Community School Society. I've got this to my list here. Uh, yeah. Interest in the Wick and Inish Community School Society. Okay. Councillor Steer. Uh, and an alternate? I don't mind being an alternate. You are. Yes. <laughs> That's excellent. All right, it's a good. It's a good time to be involved in that. Lots of good things going on. So I, I encourage you. It's. Uh, I'm excited about excited about the Wigan Community Schools Society. So I'll move that. Uh, Councillor Steer be appointed to the Wigan Community School Society as the non-voting liaison and Councillor Sloman be appointed as an alternate for a term ending the earliest of council appoints another council member. The council member ceases to hold off as the date of the inaugural meeting, the year of a general local election. Seconded by Councillor Anderson. And uh, for the comment from council, seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motions carried. We have number nine, Local Community Social Procurement Initiative Steering Committee. All right. I've been um, attending meetings when I can. Um, I'd be willing to continue. It takes a little while to get up to speed on this, and so it would probably be a good idea for me to continue. I think it's an excellent idea. <laughs> okay, I move that uh, Councillor Anderson. And Deborah Bodner, Director of Corporate Services, be appointed to the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative Steering Committee for a term ending the earliest of council points another council member. The council member ceases to hold office or the staff member is no longer employed by the district of Tofino. The date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general local election. Second by Councillor Steer. For the comment from council, saying none. All in favor? None opposed. Motions carried. Recommendation number 10, Alberta Claycott Regional District Coastal Agricultural Roundtable. Councillor, oh yeah, you're interested. Councillor Sawyer. <laughs> um, yeah, this is something I'm fairly interested in, although I know Councillor Anderson's been involved with it as well. Yep, we, we had a discussion earlier, Mayor Law, and I was willing to give this up if any, I thought Councillor Sloman or Councillor Sawyer might be interested. and. Um, since there's interest, I'd be willing to pass that on. Um, there is a meeting in two days, though, that I've yet to confirm, but it was, um, yeah. Yeah. So, there is. Yeah. So, excellent. So, I might want to attend this next meeting, but I, I don't know how that works. Does it take some time for the appointment to take effect, or? I think it's in. Partners an immediate after the meeting. But if I may, may yes, I please. Know, um, the appointment would take place immediately after the resolution. Okay. For that, but we did receive an invitation, I believe, was it from this group? Yes. Um, inviting the rest of council, um, should they wish to attend, to participate. Um, and the meeting, I believe, is tomorrow, the 23rd. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, not mistaken, but we yeah. could provide you with some more information. What time is the meeting at? I have yeah. in my head that it's 10 a.m. Do we not have a yeah. clock? Yeah. Right. But so the, the reason I'm bringing that up is because any new appointment doesn't have time to get the invite and uh, yeah. line it up. So that's. Sounds like it's taken care of, though, in more ways than one. Okay. <laughs> Please. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, and uh, we'll make that appointment. So. I'll move that uh, Councillor Sawyer be appointed as the District of Tofino Council re representative on the Alberni Claycott Regional District Coastal Agricultural Roundtable. 
for a term ending the earliest of council points another council member the council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of a general election seconded by Councillor Sloman uh any other further comment seeing none all in favor none opposed motions carried we have a new one. This is the BC Rural Health Network Implementation Committee. Uh, so this is actually a new, uh, new one. Yeah, we have the presentation. Yeah, I, I, I think um, at this point I, I'd be comfortable sitting on that one. Uh, we just, uh, I believe, uh, had a presentation. What well, two actually? Um, and I'm fairly familiar with the file, so okay. I'd be interested. All right. Other interesting council? Seeing none, we have a winner. <laughs> council, I move that Council Steer be appointed as the District of Tofino Council Representative on the BC Rural Health Network Implementation Committee for a term ending the earliest of council appoints another council member. The council member ceases to hold office the date of the inaugural meeting in the year of general local election. Second of all, Councillor Anderson, seeing no further comment from council, all in favor. Excellent. It's going to be a good one. Okay. Yes, Ms. Best. Uh, thank you, Mayor Law. Just to give Council an update, uh, thank you all for completing your appointments for the next year or sometimes longer. Um, just so you're all aware, if you are not able to attend one of your meetings, it is the council member's responsibility to notify their alternate that they should be attending in their favor. Council uh, staff just does not have the capacity to manage all of the committee uh, commitments and calendars. So just please uh, know if you're not able to make a meeting, uh, notify your alternate, you, and you can uh, CC staff just to keep us aware of something's happening. Uh, but we, we aim to have uh, always attendance uh, at these committees and appointments that we've made here. Uh, and if there isn't uh, an ability of an alternate to appear, uh, let staff know and we can manage that as well. So we can at least find the information or let the um, organizers of the committee know that uh, we might have an absence uh, coming up. So we just try to be a little organized on that. And then uh, also want to let all of council know that staff will be providing information packages to all the council members for each of their groups next week. So um, you'll get invitations and meeting invites and packages of information for each committee and group. Thank you, Ms. Best. All right, well, we're on to 10.4, which is an administrative housekeeping amendment bylaw number 1325. Now we do have a bit of PowerPoint, it looks like presentation. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Law and Council. I'm going to sit here, if that's okay, just because I'm going to run the PowerPoint from my seat. Um, this is just a very brief uh, PowerPoint just to highlight the three bylaws and for amendment and one bylaw for repeal that is uh, indicated in the report. So moving forward, um, the purpose of the housekeeping bylaw, it intends to address minor housekeeping amendments for three bylaws. One of them is the District of Tofino Business License Regulation Bylaw, the Tofino uh, Officer Employees Indemnification Bylaw, the Traffic and Parking Regulation Bylaw, and um, proposed repeal of the Tofino Recreation Commission Establishment Bylaw. Uh, the amended, uh, recommended, recommended amendments uh, for the you know, business license regulation bylaw is to replace the class nine fees in schedule A, which is the classification fee schedule with the correct amounts as previously approved by council in late 2021. The business license fees that were adopted in December 14th, 2021 were the correct amount uh, under the schedule uh, nine, uh, or sorry, the class nine fees uh, at 485 in 2022, yet due to a clear error in the class nine fees that were adopted in June 14th when we rewrote the bylaw, they were incorrect and relisted back at 450. So as, as staff um, from Productive Services indicated this, this error, we just wanted to bring this housekeeping amendment forward as soon as possible because the business license renewal period begins next week. So we want to uh, notify the community of the correct fees amount for the business licenses. And the next bylaw uh, recommended for adoption, sorry, amendment is the District of Fino Officers, Employees, and Identification Bylaw. 
the two changes that we're recommending, uh, one is that the chief administrative officer can now appoint staff members to act in their absence. Council has already indicated through a resolution that the three directors and the corporate officer are the three roles that the um, chief, chief administrative officer can appoint as acting. Um, right now, the bylaw states that the chief administrative officer needs to appoint a deputy, which isn't ac accurate into how we have our organizational structure mapped out. And that the corporate officer is able to appoint two or more deputies. Right now, the bylaw only states that the corporate officer can appoint one deputy. And as you noted earlier in this agenda and the consent agenda, we appointed three deputies today. So we just wanted to make sure that our officer's bylaw is accurate, it reads clearly, and there's no confusion of staff and acting roles. The third bylaw for amendment is the housekeeping of the traffic and parking by regulation bylaw. This is just to clarify for public members that we do not offer a parking exemption pass. Uh, it was mentioned in the previous parking bylaw, uh, and because we introduced beach pay parking for residential passes, that is not the same as an exemption permit, and we don't want to have confusion in the public. So removing the actual term exemption pass or permit from the bylaw, it was just a recommendation from our former Chief Administrative Officer Bob McPherson. And um, the other thing that he indicated was that the annual date range for paid parking for the municipal lots, which is behind this building here, have an end date. And right now the bylaw just states when the fees would be activated each year, not when they would end. So this just provides clarity for staff, for signage, uh, and things that um, would be questioned if we didn't have it specifically. And lastly uh, is the Tofino Recreation Commission uh, bylaw for repeal. Um, Feel like we've talked about this one a lot uh and so it's finally here uh because we are now appointing members to the tino uh, recreation advisory committee which means we can fully repeal this uh commission by law so that's just a, an overview and so the recommendation is that the administrative housekeeping amendment bylaw number 2022 be given first second and third. excellent thank you any questions no, would you, somebody like to read that? I'll move that the Administrative Housekeeping Amendment Bylaw number 1325 2022 be given first, second, and third readings. Seconded by Councillor Steer. Any further comment from Council? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, motion carried. Thank you, Ms. Best. Do we have uh, any business initiated by Council members? Any verbal reports? This is a standing item. Okay, seeing none, no unfinished business. Question period. Uh, Ms. Larson, do we have anybody signed up for question period? Thank you, Mayor Law. We don't currently have anybody signed up for question period, although we do have a member of the public in attendance via Zoom. And I'm unsure if there's anyone in attendance in the viewing gallery, so we will go check that. And for the member of the public who's in attendance via Zoom, I will call it three times. And if you'd like to um, ask any questions about an agenda item, just use the Q&A function and um, include your name, the agenda item you'd like to speak to, um, and your address. So calling once, calling twice, calling three times, there's nobody signed up. Okay, super. Then I'm going to move us into closed session. I recommend that the meeting be closed and the public pursuant to section 90 of the community charter to discuss matters related to 1A personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for position of an officer, employer, agent of a municipality, or another position appointed by the municipality. One, seeing labor relations or other employee relations. One, J, information that is prohibited or information that if it were presented in a document would be prohibited from disclosure under Section 21 of the Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act. And one, L, discussions with municipal officers and employees respecting municipal objectives, marriages, and progress reports. For the purposes of preparing an annual report under Section 98 Annual Municipal Report. Seconded by Councillor Steer. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carried. We're going to give you a sec to move us into closed session. If anybody needs a quick 